Um, welcome everyone. So nice to have you here for our exciting uh, second webinar in the series uh, which is entitled Researching Culture, Learning and Technology. And this is a collaborative event between the AECT's CLT, Culture, Learning and Technology Division, and Emerge Africa. But I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. We've discussed it in our first webinar. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. So we've got Bodie Anderson, Amy Bradshaw, Akisha Horton, and Michael Thomas. Bodhi is currently an assistant professor of instructional technology at Indian River State College. Amy Bradshaw is a associate professor of instructional psychology and technology at the University of Oklahoma. Akisha is a learning design development and innovation coordinator for the United States Air Force. And Michael Thomas, apologies, <laughs> I'm yeah, Michael, I think I'm going to have to double check your bio. <laughs> I feel terrible. It's like blank moment. Um, no, it's not. I have to worry because I'm usually a very, very prepared person. Um, yeah, but I met Michael when I was at the AECT convention. Thank you, University of Illinois. And what, what do you, you can add what you teach. So he's at University of Illinois in Chicago. Educational psychology. Okay, so overlap there with Amy. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Bodhi first. And I hope you all enjoy uh, the session. What we can do is you can type uh, questions as we go along. And depending on the presenter, maybe you, if we have time, we can take it, take these questions at the end of the session. Okay, over to you, Bodhi. Hello, everyone, and uh, good morning or afternoon to you. Um, everyone can hear me, correct? Somebody can shoot me a smiley face or something. Okay, somebody said yes. Okay, in any case, um, I also assume that we can control. If I make a change here, everyone's able to see that. Um, uh, that we can control the slides from our little panel here. So I hope everyone can see that I'm on the first slide and moving to the second slide now. Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure. I'm going to quickly go over my topic. Um, again, for this presentation, we are focusing on primarily on our frameworks. And uh, the frameworks uh, that I um, have used is uh, Hofstede, or Hofstede, depending on how you pronounce it, uh, cultural dimensions. And hold on, let me get a little timer started for myself here. Uh, and then if we have time, I'm going to look at my uh, instrumentation, which is uh, a discourse analysis uh, model. So um, I'm going to go over a few of these things ra rather quickly, because as uh, experts in the field, a lot of them don't need uh, too much explaining. Uh, the overview here is that uh, looking at computer-mediated conversation or CMC-based distance learning. Originally, uh, the online platform uh, was thought to eliminate cultural issues, which appear frequently in face-to-face um, -face and blended classrooms. However, uh, recent studies, when I say recent, I, I mean within, in the past uh, seven or eight years, research has found that this isn't always true. Um, and when we look at um, uh, distance learning, which is one of the, the first things we're going to do, is operationalize uh, culture and uh, distance learning. And I will be using the terms distance learning and distance education uh, interchangeably here, even though I know some people do not, uh, just wanted to make that known, um, is that we find a problem with social constructivist uh, based factors, such as uh, kind of inter intersubjective construction of knowledge and student-centered classes. Um, so when we look at distance education, uh, Garrison, uh, Randy Garrison and Garrison Atwell, two, two of, of the famous folks in the field, um, tell us this is really driven by two symbiotic impetuses, and the first being the technology, which is the CNC medium, and the second being uh, the key theory, uh, social constructivism, and many would also argue uh, connectivism. Uh, George Simmons is connectivism as well now. Um, so this study focuses on looking at uh, social constructivism and social constructivist-based Western models. Because when we look at models of distance education that have been created, a lot of them are coming uh, 
out, out of Western Europe and, and the United States and then kind of being applied in a, for lack of a better term, copy-pasted format across the world. And this is not always, uh, this is not always jiving well with uh, all of the other cultures out there. Um, and again, this, this is what I already covered. Uh, there's a very heavy, we heavy Western influence on, uh, on current models of distance education. Oh, is my, is my sound disappearing? Um, let me quickly try and... Um, there we go. Is that better? Okay, somebody says it's better. Okay, so in, in, in looking at um, specifically, uh, again, social structure based models of, of learning, we see that uh, um, this doesn't always work for cultures that have traditionally uh, teacher-centered classrooms, like a lot of cultures in East Asia and the Middle East. And uh, when looking at roles of, of peers, because some uh, cultures have very, very different relationships uh, for peers interacting with each other, uh, in, in, front of, in front of their teachers and also based on the seniority, uh, upper classmen and lower classmen don't always uh, speak to each other well. Um, so in operationalizing culture, uh, we look at Geert Hofstede's, Hofstede's uh, model of cultural dimensions. Uh, back in the early 80s, he developed uh, a model, and again, we're focusing primarily on the framework here. Um, a model for, for empirically measuring culture. He does this at a national level. Um, of course, with a term as broad as culture, we have got many, you know, there's, it's been operationalized uh, in many ways. Um, the nice thing about Hofstede's model, and again, while well, it does only apply to national levels, is that uh, we can actually get some empirical data, uh, some, some quantitative empirical data at that, um, to kind of help us uh, view cultural through a context, context which is measurable. Um, now, there are six dimensions which are used, and, and actually a seventh one can include halls, which we're, we'll be looking at. Um, and, but it's rare for all six of these uh, dimensions to be used together in a single study. Uh, instead, um, studies will usually focus on one or two most pertinent dimensions. And for my study, I've, I've looked at a, uh, a Japanese population. Um, I've identified three uh, dimensions that will be very outstanding in that they are very different uh, from, from those of the Western classroom, and we're going to be discussing those. We're going to be spending much more time discussing those, and then, if, again, if we have time, go into the uh, instrumentation a little bit. And those are individual collectivism, uh, power distance, and uh, cultural communication context. So when we look at individualism and collectivism, and, and all of Hofstede's, Hofstede's dimensions can be seen uh, much like one look at a, a, like, a Likert scale. Um, so if a country is more individualistic, it is going to be less collectivistic. Um, individualism, um, individualistic culture, such as the United, sorry, the United States, uh, value uh, the goals of the individual. And you'll notice uh, students in America uh, are often seen uh, as being quite outspoken in, in, in many places in Europe, whereas collectivist cultures um, value uh, group goals and social harmony. So if, if we look at things like intersubjective creation of knowledge and high learner interaction, um, we could see a potential problem with this as um, cultures which value social harmony um, above, uh, I guess, the, the views of the opinion, uh, uh, sorry, the, the views and opinions of the individual um, <clears throat> would, would have a, a problem with, I guess, speaking out in class, uh, amongst other things. Um, in America, I guess the old adage is the squeaky wheel gets the oil, actually. European as well, whereas uh, in, in Japan, uh, the, the adage would be uh, the, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. It might, might seem a, a, a bit uh, vicious, but I guess it, it does go to show you the emphasis on maintaining social harmony above expressing the views of the individual. Overly. Now, power distance is an interesting model, and it's, it's the extent to which power, prestige, and wealth, especially in the classroom, you know, power, um, the extent to which a society is comfortable with unequal levels, and, and, and this has a lot to do in, in many cultures with uh, goals of the teacher. Uh, again, it, for instance, in, in Japan, it, students would never question their teacher. The teachers have a very strong classroom presence, and uh, without a strong uh, teacher presence in the classroom, students um, don't, or classes are not very successful over there. And also looking uh, within uh, a culture, uh, 
uh, things like neo-Confucianist roles in East Asia, where younger classmen always must respect and obey older classmen, um, therefore creating potential conflict uh, when students, uh, again, when we're looking at social constructivist uh, student-centered classrooms um, with intersubjective um, and intersubjective and negotiated models of knowledge generation. Now, finally, I want to look at a high and low uh, communication context briefly. Now, this is uh, actually more of a linguistic feature, um, as it focuses more on the language. Now, when we look at something like English, English has many different dialects, and uh, of course, you've got the, the Queen's proper English, as many would say. Um, uh, Singlish, uh, Indian English has many different dialects. Uh, American. Um, so in looking at high and low communication context, a, a low communication context, such as the U.S. and Europe, uh, speech predominantly occurs through explicit statements. People tend to mean what they say, whereas in many um, Middle Eastern countries, South American countries, um, and Asian countries, um, their messages are often implied um, rather than directly stated. Uh, for instance, I was when I used to teach uh, at a university in Japan, um, a colleague of mine, uh, who was uh, an Australian, uh, he came in during the summer and uh, came in uh, wearing his shorts um, because it was summer, there wasn't many students around. And one of the Japanese professors said to him, oh, you look very, very nice. You look so young, just like the students. And uh, what sounded like he might have been complimenting my colleague, uh, saying, you look nice and young like the students. The actual meaning there uh, would have been, hey, we're professionals here. Uh, don't come in with your shorts and, and uh, even though it's summer uh, dress profession. Now this is one thing where you can see a lot of a lot of um, social cues that could be lost uh, potentially in in the CNC medium. So those are the primary um, cultural dimensions that I have chosen to focus on. But again, there's six more, um, including uncertainty avoidance and roles of masculinity and femininity in cultures. And in for in, in generating your own research, it is always good to um, see which dimensions are out there and which ones might apply. Uh, so, and again, in connecting the culture and the distance learning, my uh, group of students I looked at, which were Japanese university learners, they were very collectivistic and they had a high communication context. And in my research, they, their interactions focused not so much on generation of knowledge and, and debating and negotiating answers, but more about keeping group harmony and avoiding social conflict and contradictory statements. Students would never outright, they would never outright um, question the teacher or question each other. Um, and also, again, do the power distance models. Um, teachers, the way, the feedback of teachers um, is much stronger than, than those of their peers oftentimes. So students in my study would ignore their peers' attempts to clarify things unless it was, again, supported by teaching. Um, so in, in looking at the study, what I've done is use collaborative uh, interaction, which is a key, sorry, let's see, I've got about two, more, two or three more minutes left here, which is uh, collaborative interaction, which is a key um, element to successful online learning. And again, you can read about this in the chapter, how I do this um, with these cultural dimensions. So I want to very briefly look at uh, my instrument. So what I did, because um, in a, a previous academic life I was a, an applied ling a linguist, and so what I did is use a, um, a, a coding scheme developed by Curtis and Lawson and then later used by uh, many studies. I think Curtis Bob did a famous study uh, with this and, and so on Rush did another nice one, uh, which looks at um, linguistic data which we've taken in the form of, of posts of on a discussion board from a class. And so what this data, what, what this uh, instrument does is give us a, uh, a mixed methods approach, which I always prefer a mixed methods approach, which gives us both sides. Um, in looking at the quantitative data, we've got the different codes, as I'll briefly show you, and also the qualitative data is if you can actually use the words of the students and, and, and look at specific instances to support, um, support findings. So the instrument, um, what we look here is is uh, is we code each. You use a integrator reliability and, and a few coders, and you code different part different parts of the posts into this bigger scheme, which I will very briefly show at the end. The important thing to note here is that we're not so much interested in. Um, okay, let me just wrap up. I'll I'll, I'll take thirty more seconds. Uh, the important thing here is, is to look at 
the, 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 the N here is not the number of participants, but the number of, of codes here. And um, let me just quickly show you what some of these look like. Um, we've got primary categories like planning and contributing. And they, they break into little smaller codes in here. But for the sake of time, I will uh, wrap it up. And I believe Amy is presenting next. If you have any more questions, again, feel free to email me. Let me um, get to Amy's slide here. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Happy to be here with you. Um, by way of introduction, uh, let me just say that education and educational technology are human endeavors and that we humans are not neutral. Our professional work reflects our positionalities and our priorities, both individually and collectively. And individuals and in increasingly educational technology professionals and organizations are beginning to recognize the urgent need to understand the complex interactions between culture, learning, and technology. And with this growing realization, merely replicating what and how educational technology has been practiced in the past is no longer sufficient. It's not adequate to assess the value and appropriateness of current and future efforts according to only our own uh, experiences, perceptions, and perspectives or those of the people uh, most closely surrounding us. So I just for a moment want to share the most recent official definition of educational technology from the Association of Educational for Educational Communications and Technology, and that is the study and ethical practice of facilitating learning and improving performance by creating, using, and managing appropriate technological processes and resources. And you might have almost missed the word ethical in there, but this 2008 version is the first time that that word actually include, that is included in the AECT official definition. And definitional emphasis on ethical practice requires that we keep culture-related issues, such as relevance, access, equality, and inclusion foregrounded in our work. However, our professional and academic training in the past has tended to ignore and neglect the ways and issues of culture interact with, edu with learning and technology. And this hinders our abilities to engage our professional work ethically. So for the field of educational technology to be dynamic and adaptive and culturally relevant and ethically responsible, we need to reassess our practices both individually and collectively, uh, in terms of the further learning needed um, for at the, at the nexus of culture, learning, and technology. So critical pedagogy offers a powerful and ethical means for considering our practices and perspectives as educational technologists, particularly as we're grappling with how to better synthesize culture with learning and technology. And what you can see in front of you is just an overview of the chapter itself. And I've marked in blue the pieces of the chapter that we're going to touch on um, lightly. Uh, so there's the chapter itself gives an overview of critical pedagogy. It's assumed that people come to the chapter with some background uh, in educational technology broadly. And then uh, we spend, we'll spend a little bit of time today uh, talking about praxis uh, education for transformation, um, tensions and resonances, and then toward a praxis of inclusive practice. And let's jump right in. So praxis is um, really the heart of this project. The writing this chapter was itself uh, a, a form of personal praxis for me in coming to terms with, uh, with what I've recognized as uh, a lack and an omission in our field and in our training and preparation for the field. So I'm relying here on Freire's uh, definition of praxis, which goes beyond the common popular conception of praxis as simply being a combination of um, theory and practice. Freire's conception of praxis uh, takes it a little bit further and has three very important components. Uh, the first of these is naming. Uh, that is clearly articulating um, and identifying, making visible the issue or dynamic uh, that typically is causing some oppressive situation. 
from the perspective of those most at risk uh, of being harmed. And the second major component is considering, is critically reflecting, considering the issue in its full human and historic context from multiple perspectives uh, and through engaged dialogue with others, especially those individuals who are most at risk. And then the third part, taking meaningful action to transform or disrupt unjust practices, systems, and structures. Now, all three of these elements are critically necessary. If a problem is not accurately named before reflection and action are engaged, there's a high risk of an issue being misperceived and subsequently being inadequately addressed. If um, an oppressive dynamic is accurately named, but action is taken without critical reflection, if we skip that second step, then wrong action may be taken and harmful dynamics may be exacerbated or additional harms may be created. And then finally, if a harmful dynamic is accurately named and is critically reflected on, but no action to transform or disrupt is engaged, then the status quo perpetuates. Uh, the chapter moves on um, to talk about uh, transformation, education for transformation. And this, again, is one of the uh, key principles uh, or concepts um, of uh, critical pedagogy. So what you have here is a table that just uh, is a rough comparison of transmissive educational approaches versus transformative educational approaches. So from, for transmissive, that's um, learning disregards or supplants learners' lived contexts or experiences. It almost doesn't matter who the learners are. We can transfer this learning module as a commodity into various um, settings and contexts with different people. Um, Friday refers to the banking model where you deposit knowledge as a commodity, where you can almost take it from one mind to another and duplicate it from person to person. He refers to this type of knowledge as a corpse because it's dead, it's not active, it's not being constructed. In uh, contrast with transformative education, where learning is grounded necessarily in learners' own directly lived lives, um, contexts, and experiences. And Friere recommended and relied more on a problem-posing model. So looking at issues in the insider's direct lives, what's going on here, and problematizing situations to find out what were the harmful dynamics so that those could be identified, reflected on, and then addressed. So the, here you can see the contrast, and I won't go through too many of them except uh, to point out uh, the, the authoritarian, fact-based, content-based, task-centered, teacher-centered, closed-ended, all of these fit with transmissive approaches um, versus more explorative, more meaning-based, more learner-centered, and community-centered, not only individual learners, and open-ended um, fit better with transformative educational approaches. Also, in terms of outcomes of these approaches, Transmissive education tends to reinforce, both engage and reinforce lower order cognition, declarative knowledge, identification, as opposed to synthesis and problem solving and creativity. Uh, transmissive education tends to support development and maintenance of external locus of control, tends to domesticate and alienate individuals and marginalized people and replicates and perpetuates the status quo. That is, in fact, its purpose is to perpetuate um, the status quo, that successful systems are self-replicating, and that applies to our educational systems as well. Um, versus transformative education, which requires higher order cognition because it is, by its nature, an ill-structured problem, if you want to use that terminology, uh, that you're always in a fresh context, always creating and constructing new understanding of what the situation is and what needs to be done to make it more equitable and just. Uh, so transformative education supports development of an internal locus of control and more self-regulation. It empowers individuals and marginalized people, and it enables, better enables, a societal shift toward social justice. 
Uh, and then in the chapter, I compare um, it really more try to find some tensions and resonances between these two general fields or approaches, so educational technology and critical pedagogy. So I did this by um, looking at them in terms of what are the underlying foundations of the fields themselves, where did they come from, what are the um, general tendencies it's in terms of philosophical underpinnings and orientations, and what are the main priorities. So we can see here, I'm just going to jump to the philosophical underpinnings that really educational technology runs the whole range um, of ontological and epistemological stances from positivism to critical constructivism. It really depends on what the individual educational technologist brings. Uh, claims uh, or goals of objectivity are frequently encountered. Um, it may actually be subjectivity disguised uh, as objective um, through objective methods or, or so-called objective methodologies. There's a tendency to avoid, uh, notice the quotes around political, unless the lesson is specifically on politics. And then there tends to be silence about uh, social justice issues. Um, usually seen as being beyond the scope of mainstream of the field. In contrast, critical pedagogy tends to be critically interpretivist by and large, um, unless somebody is coming to it new and um, is novice to critical pedagogy, they may bring different underlying philosophical uh, orientations and stances. Um, but as the base of critical pedagogy is that you cannot avoid the political, that all spaces, including educational spaces, are inherently political. And that silence on matters of social justice is a political tool to reinforce and reproduce the status quo and dominant groups in order. Um, I'll, you can see the, pro I'm just going to jump on from there. Hopefully you've had a chance to see that. Additional um, categories that I looked at, tendencies, scope and scale, what is the view of education, and what is the purpose of education. I'm just going to cruise on because I notice I'm, I'm very short on time. So uh, after setting up these premises and these purposes, the last section, the last major section of the chapter looks at how can we take this and, and engage this as a sort of praxis toward equitable and inclusive practice as instructional technologists. So if you remember, there are these three parts to praxis, and another very important feature of praxis is that it must be grounded in uh, in the particular context, and that you cannot provide a formula that tells people how to engage it. So what I'm trying to provide here is a guideline for how to begin, um, but the expectation is that as you try to fit this to your local context, it will have to adapt and change and be modified, and as you go along, you figure some things out. Um, so there's a section where we talk about, uh, in the chapter, um, that our collective ignorance must be addressed if we're serious about including ethical practice as part of the definition of our field. Um, it goes into some detail about epistemic ignorance, um, lays the foundation for that. I'm going to skip this for now and invite you to please read the chapter to get that part. There's some really fascinating work being done on epistemologies of ignorance. A critically reflective um, phase as a, as a suggested starting part, uh, starting place would be to expand your reading list, seek uh, input, engagement, and support from partners and mentors so that you're not doing this completely on your own. Find people who are working in these, these fields. They may not know educational technology, but they can certainly share from their perspectives uh, information that we don't have. And one thing that I keep coming to over and over again is that the answers we seek to understand um, how to appropriately engage culture toward equity and inclusion are not going to be found completely within our own field. We are going to have to cross boundaries of fields and disciplines uh, in order to transform our own field to be more responsive and responsible um, at the intersections of culture, learning, and technology. And then to start developing practices of self-reflection and critical self-interrogation. In the chapter, 
I provide um, 14 multi-part uh, questions to help us begin some critical self-interrogation. And these are just suggestions and examples. Again, this is not intended to be formulaic or a template or a model that should be applied, rather some things to get you started thinking about how, how you would construct a praxis within your own um, particular settings. And then taking action, these are some examples, again, of ways that action could be taken. But again, it must be based on the, the particular naming and critical reflection in that particular phase, uh, in the particular context. So just to wrap up here, um, as a framework for engaging educational technology, critical pedagogy provides a powerful approach to a much needed transformation in our field specifically in terms of understanding culture as inseparable from learning and technology. That it empowers us to reject practices and tendencies that relegate members of our field to being mere mechanics and technical workers, exercising only enough volition and imagination to effectively fill the gaps in dominant systems and thus reinforce them. We don't want to be those kinds of mechanics. Um, we have PhDs, so let's um, live up to the doctor of philosophy that we have as, as PhDs in the field um, and find some new ways and new approaches uh, and new ways to engage our field that are um, ethically responsible. And that using this framework opens unlimited opportunities to engage new or continuing work with hope, optimism, and ethical purpose. And I'm sorry that was so fast, but I do invite you to um, read the chapter and um, I would welcome uh, communication about the, the chapter. And I'll stop now so that uh, the next person can get going. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, I um, want to start off with my research questions and and to connect it to my um, theoretical framework. And um, the purpose of this study was to think about how do urban youth look at um, and define um, global citizenship in the 21st century? Uh, what global issues are most important to urban youth? And if um, they are making connections to hip hop to these issues. And we did this by asking how does participating in a technology course that allows them to engage with digital text, hip hop text, um, and, um, and respond to these texts, shape how they define and enact and in practices of global citizenship, and also in what ways can a technology course that engages urban youth in researching global issues and creating hip hop texts in response to them be adapted to different contexts. So I'm going to start off by talking about a little bit about the theoretical framework that was used here. Um, it's, the chapter is framed by the critical cosmopolitan theory. Um, it provides a conceptual model that analyzes the development of critically conscious global competencies. This model was inspired by Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educationalist, excuse me, educationist that um, wrote about that critical consciousness was the higher purpose of education. And so when, we, when eyes are open to society's injustices, Freire argues that people are ready to begin rewriting their world. By rewriting their world, he means that the transformation of how people engage in creative endeavors and social activities in order to address the systems of, of power and transform societal injustices um, through this practice. When we think about the term cosmopolitan, it's a term that is synonymous with global competencies and global citizenships and is wrapped up into two big ideas about what it means to be human. One idea is that humans, excuse me, as humans, we have an obligation to one another. So this idea that we are in contact with each other and we have responsibilities to be respectful to one another and make sure that we're both living in har that we are living in harmony with each other. The other idea is that we take value in human lives which means taking an interest in different practices. So this, this 
course for us was important. Uh, was, um, we were interested in ha looking at how urban youth in different parts of the world, as, as many as possible, could um, connect to these ideas of global citizenship. In the United States and in some other parts of the world, urban youth struggle to get access to basic fundamentals in education, such as math, reading, and science. However, it's always argued that we're preparing youth in all parts of the world to be able to go out and compete in a globalized, digitally literate society that relies on them having the knowledge of, the, of technological tools and how to transfer them, tra transfer the knowledge of how these tools work in different contexts um, in their daily practice. However, training for that is often a luxury for many urban youth. And um, we recognized that there were several natural overlaps that existed between the three fields that were being studied in this um, through this course, which was again global citizenship, digital literacies, and hip hop. Um, so I talked a bit about global citizenships, um, and what I'll really focus in right now is on hip hop. Um, hip hop is a global phenomenon, um, and if you look at it from a language point of view, um, such as um, that which is studied by Samuel M., Alistair Pennycook, and Tony Mitchell, they look at it, they would define it as a language from within a multi ethnic, multilingual, global hip hop nation. Uh, and it's a postmodern nation that has an international reach because hip hop can be found all over the world. Um, it has a fluid capacity to cross borders and a reluctance to adhere to a geopolitical given of the present. So um, hip hop can be broken down into five different elements. That's graffiti, which is the writing of the language, emceeing, which is the oral griot or conveyor of the message, DJ, which is the which is um, defined in two different terms. It can be you can look at it as the heartbeat or the drum or the art of the movement, and also from another perspective, you can look at it as the technology that's used to deliver the message. B boys and B girls are the people who actually perform, so the people that dance and provide a kinesthetic motion to the music and, and allow it to be a, a, another modality outside of of written and spoken word. And then knowledge is the fifth element that um, is new, that's new to the conversation of academic discussions of hip hop. However, um, hip hop artists have always um, noted that that's their number one goal to uh, make sure that you are overstanding something or to have a deeper or a more critical understanding of a subject area that hip hop is intended to explore. This study looked at socially conscious global hip hop, so hip hop from all over the world, and had students get in contact with these conversations. Um, and again, when we talk about the, the, the unions that we saw in these three topics, one commonality was that global citizen and socially conscious hip-hop inherently relied on a foundation of social justice. Hip-hop originated as a way to tell the stories of people in urban areas or disenfranchised areas that weren't being um, delivered in the, in the main news stream. And they put it to a beat so that it was easy to catch, or so that it would be more easier to catch on to and people would, would take that message and listen to it and have that overstanding of it that I mentioned earlier. And digital literacies also seek to have people have an overstanding in some ways of human, cultural, and societal issues. But the focus in this case would be as they relate to technology and the practice of ethical behavior. And so the goal was to set these three ideas in conversation with each other and, and examine how artists were using their music to connect um, the listeners to ideas of global citizenship and to examine how 
artists were taking advantage of the affordances of video and other digital technologies in order to communicate their messages. And then have students use global citizenship and hip-hop, what they learn through the course, in order to create a digital work that conveys that message. So some components of the course were to have students, uh, we first were to find people from different parts of the world. Um, and in this case, it was a combination of people who lived in the area, as well as um, graduate students who um, were from different parts of the world to translate different hip hop texts. And we focused in on people who were hip hop aficionados so that they could also explain what the text meant. So they, so the students in this course examined text from the Czech Republic, from Mexico, from South, from different parts of South America, from different parts of Asia and Africa, and, and had translators there that were able to talk about not just what the text meant, but what it meant in the time period in which it was delivered, so the context of the society and into the specific demographic in which the text may have been um, aimed at at that time. So, um, for example, this text, um, this feature, which I know is kind of hard to read, is aimed at talking about some of the racial tensions that are taking place in the Czech Republic. Um, and so the, the main audience, is um, to the more dominant culture in the Czech Republic. However, the message is open for anyone to listen to. Um, some other things that they did were they connect, were, were making connections to where, um, explicit connections to where the text was created and using digital tools to locate where those texts were originated from. Um, and, and we used Google tools for two reasons. One, because um, it was free, and two, because it allowed the students to access things like um, geographical tools um, and um, writing tools and a, a combination of tools in order to explore the, uh, explore the hip hop text in a little bit more detail. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll skip for, uh, more of what happened in the class. Um, we used a principal method, uh, excuse me, a principal assemblage of methodologies such as act participatory action research, um, interviews with students, the artifacts from the class, polls and surveys from the students, in order to uh, and collected that data and tri triangulated it in order to do the analysis. This took place, this particular place, this took, excuse me, this particular class took place in Australia, in Sydney, um, over, um, it was um, shortened to a three-day period. Um, some of the challenges were um, getting intellectual property, getting artists to come in, um, the um, authenticity, um, the cost, associated with getting artists to come in um, in consistent attendance and participation. However, um, we did find that the students were able to engage in quite a few practices of global citizenship. I'll focus in on two. One was compassion. Um, and one of the goals of this course was to help increase their awareness of commonalities that existed between people situated across the globe and themselves. Um, so since hip hop is a global phenomenon, this course aims to help um, students create plural allegiances um, with, um, with, with others besides themselves. And the students created a song that was dedicated to talking about an issue where they showed compassion to another group of students that um, were a lot younger than them. They also talked about creativity. The students use wordplay, humor, religious faith, um, um, in order to, with the goal of attracting 
the interests of their fellow students and to get them to buy into this idea of a movement that was taking place in, that they wanted to take place in their school in order to improve the lives of other students in their school. Um, let's see. Um, the implications for the courses that we found that um, that linked to the idea of our new ways that young people might enact in citizenship. Often the debate is limited to just what their civic knowledge is about government, about voting, or charity events. While that's not necessarily bad, it's uh, foolish to limit our understanding of enacted citizenship to just these, and rather we look at other ways that young people behave as citizens. So this was our goal um, to help um, to look at a more creative way in a way that students could already connect to to talk about issues of citizenship. Thank you. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, please let me know if you can hear me okay. But I'll get started. Um, I want to start by saying that um, uh, my discussion here is going to be really based on uh, the chapter in our book, uh, Culture, Learning, and Technology. And that's also based on my own experiences doing work in uh, educational technology work in Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, uh, Taiwan, Oman, and Turkey. And I've published articles on educational technology in uh, in Malaysia, Taiwan, and Oman, and working on one now in Turkey. I want to mention that um, culture is important to pay attention to, not because um, it's a fancy thing to, um, or a trendy thing to talk about, but rather because it is the way that we make meaning of the world. We make meaning in groups, and our understandings or our overstandings of things um, really are, are grounded in culture. Also, right now, we're living in a time of globalization. And globalization has the effect of uh, compressing time and compressing space. So what's happening? is that uh, things are becoming dislocated because of globalization. So culture is an important thing to be, uh, to be studying, but we have to consider the context of globalization. In terms of time, many people are noticing that technology is really uh, reshaping everything. It's compressing time and compressing space. Um, and therefore is driving globalization itself. And many people have written about uh, the phenomenon of the 21st century learning, learner. So over and over and over again, what I've seen and what uh, myself and some other people have written about is um, the fact that technology is something that not only changes is everything, but it's something that's very, very hard to argue against. This has been called the technological sublime, the technological sublime. And what that means is that technology is something that is seen as a fundamental problem solver. There is no problem that does not have a technological solution. Any problem that we have can be solved with technology. If we just have enough technology or the right technology or the appropriate technology, it's going to solve all of our problems. At the same time, what's influenced educational technology so much and many, many other things in the globalized world is neoliberalism. So neoliberalism is kind of a fancy word 
to refer to um, the idea that corporate entities or the business world should be left alone to do its business, to do what, it's, what it wants to do. This is not quite the same as a completely laissez-faire approach to uh, government and economics, because with neoliberalism, governments are supposed to protect uh, businesses and should act in the interest of businesses to um, open up markets and, um, and support the entities in, in whatever ways uh, they possibly can. So the other point um, in this three-point um, three model is performative implementation. Performative implementation. In other words, look at my cool stuff. Look at what I've got here. So all over the world, um, if you were to take, uh, take a tour of a school, they're bound to show you their uh, computer lab and they'll say, oh, look at the fancy uh, new projector, the new computers, uh, the new server. Look at all the cool stuff that we've uh, got here. Um, um, in, in one article, I called this cosmetic compliance. In other words, what people want to do is uh, show off uh, the technology and apply technology to instructional problems, but without thinking about culture and context uh, and, these, um, and these other essential matters. So this creates a sense of left-behindedness. People are made to feel left behind if they don't have uh, the newest and coolest technology that someone is going to uh, um, is going to sell to them. Um, uh, countries, as well as individuals, cities, groups of people, are all told, "Don't be left behind. Don't be left behind. Don't be left behind." Um, so, therefore, buy this. Buy this uh, technology. So over and over and over again, we see uh, this convergence of uh, performative implementation, the technological sublime, and neoliberalism. I lifted this advertisement from a real estate um, a real estate site. Uh, how technology is changing real estate. Don't be left behind. You should be afraid if you don't have uh, the newest and the best uh, technology. And so why should we care about all of these sorts of things? Part of globalization and part of uh, 21st century context is not just the, um, the excitement of new and cool tools, it's also many bad things that are happening all over the world. And in doing our research, uh, we should be considering how do we understand uh, culture, and then how do we implement educational technologies in ways that are appropriate for the culture, but that account for the problems and the pressures of the technological sublime, Am I just using a technological solution in search of a problem? Am I being muscled by neoliberalism? Or is this just a performative implementation? And so then we have to look carefully and do serious research about the cultures of implementation and the cultures of the context of those for whom we design. And any kind of research results in some sort of representation of the people that, um, uh, that we're doing research on. And we have to pay very close attention to how we create representations, uh, because representation matters. Uh, these images, by the way, are taken from uh, zoos in America. 
the man on the right, Otto Benga, was uh, famously um, um, captured and put on display in a zoo in New York City. And he ended up taking his own life. Uh, so in any case, what we're interested in doing is finding approaches that have a great deal of cultural relevance, cultural relevance, and that take into account performative implementation, neoliberalism, and the technological sublime. So in my own work here in Chicago, um, I was interested in teaching about technology and computer science uh, for a population that's uh, mostly African American. And the approach that we're taking now is one of collectible card games. Collectible card games are a feature of uh, youth culture. Um, also, they're a low energy technology. It doesn't, doesn't cost that much uh, to create a card game uh, compared to something like a video game or something um, something uh, more complex or other highly uh, high technology solutions. And so what we're doing right now in a project supported by the National Science Foundation is creating a, um, um, a collectible card game to teach children cyber security. And this is to promote the habits of mind of cyber security uh, professionals. Of course, that's sort of an attack and defend uh, uh, kind of uh, practice that happens over and over and over again. There's a, a hacker and defense against the hacker. And that maps on well to uh, collectible card games. Uh, we now have a uh, working version of the card game. Uh, but we're just now starting to put some art onto the um, onto the cards and working out uh, some of the bugs with this. So again, the point here is to try to find solutions that accord with culture, that harmonize with culture. And that requires having a good understanding of culture while paying a great deal of attention to how we create representations of the cultural groups we do research with, while also paying attention to this intersection of performative imp implementation, uh, the technological sublime, and neoliberalism. I just wanted to say to my colleagues, uh, uh, thank you for working with me over the years. And uh, I encourage collaborative work. Please work together. And don't be afraid of, um, of the naysayers and people who might be uh, discouraging. Just go out and try, and things tend to fall into place. So uh, that's my comments, and I thank you again. Wow, thanks so much, Michael. It's been really, really fascinating. And Amy, and Akisha, and Bodhi, it's been really fascinating hearing more about your chapters. I just want to read all of them. Um, I was wondering if we could take a few extra minutes. I know it's gone past 2 o'clock, but a few minutes for questions. Um, please type your questions into the text chat, folks. As well as some of your highlights from the session. And I also want to mention that um, um, we'll have a third webinar in the series because uh, it's been kind of rushed and in the first one we didn't get around to Lachelle uh, sharing her um, her work. So we're going to have a third webinar on the 31st of October. I think that's Halloween. But I'm wondering if I could hand over to one of our presenters. Um, yeah, any reflections? Um, and maybe you have questions as well. Oh, book winner. Yes, we've got three book winners. Um, Frank Longolo, who had an interesting tweet. I, just, I 
can find Frank's tweet. Um, yeah, anyway, we'll, I'll find it later. And then Karn, Ferreira, Mayerfeld, and Olufemi. Um, who shared on Facebook. So Karen and Olufemi both shared on Facebook in our event page. And I hope we can discuss a bit further um, in our Facebook event page. So if there is any, and I was even, you know, found so interesting articles very much related to what we've been discussing in these webinars. I thought I really need to share them on that on that Facebook <laughs> event page. Okay, any questions? Yes, Tony is looking forward to meeting you all in Jacksonville, the AACT convention. Oh great. Michael will be there, Akisha. Okay, so it doesn't look like we have any questions. Um, Anna said no questions. And Jakob uh, will get in touch with Karen, Olufemi, and um, Frank. Pleasure, thank you, Michael. Can, can I hand over to you to say a few closing words, Michael? Yes, I just wanted to um, encourage all of us to uh, consider the major uh, theme of the book and of the entire group in AACT and uh, that is the intersection of uh, uh, culture, learning, and technology. And I think um, we all become stronger and, and better at doing our own work when we uh, share our problems and share both our uh, successes and our struggles so that we can um, help with finding solutions for these uh, for these problems. Thanks, Michael. Akisha, some closing words from you? Um, I I, I, I hope that we can continue the conversation in Jacksonville. And I was just looking up, and, and I hope one of the other presenters can share with you what date and time our division meeting is, because these are issues I believe we're all passionate about, the intersection of culture, learning, and technology. And we really would like to keep the discussions going in ways that we can get more research out there and, as also, and also practice to help promote the um, union of these ideas. Oh, and thank you. I also want to say thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about the chapter and just to um, collaborate with all of you. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just to um, build off of what I was saying. Uh, Cultural studies in um, in educational technology is actually cultural studies are quite old, and educational technology is um, getting older. I guess uh, um, cultural studies and cultural issues are still uh, not at the forefront of uh, ed tech research in a lot of journals. I think that there's more, and more journals and, and conferences, and uh, uh, those of us researching culture and interested in culture in, in ed tech. Uh, to get together and, and provide more uh, spaces uh, to discuss and uh, promote studies of the intersection of these two fields. Uh, Amy. 
I guess I just want to say that I, I, I'm really excited about where we are as more people recognize the necessity of looking at culture, learning, and technology together, and the fact that they really are inseparable. They are always interacting and working with each other um, synergistically, whether or not we are recognizing it. So it's a beautiful time for our field to take stock. And if uh, the practice of educational technology has gotten easy for us, or we think we've, we've got it handled, this is a new opportunity to um, see the challenge that we need to be able to rise to, that we do need to um, start fresh. And it's a new open problem. Um, constantly if we're looking at it through the angle of how, how am I engaging my practice in ways that are as just and equitable uh, as can be? And how can I transform my practice so that I am being an agent for justice and, and um, equitable practice? Thanks again, everyone. It was a really exciting uh, webinar. And just a reminder, 31st of October, same time, we'll have our third one in the series. So I know it's early morning and a lot of places in the US. Hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Um, it's 2 o'clock at the moment, uh, South African time. Not sure what time it is on your side, Olufemi. It'll be an hour later. Oh, but Nevertheless, what time? I hope everyone has a great day further, and let's keep in touch via the Facebook event page. Bye for now.